Well, if you do have a Bible, please have it open at Luke chapter 19. One thing that really upsets people is when they miss out on a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Have you ever been in that situation when you've missed out on a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity? It could be uh, something like um, the person who's a little bit short of money and uh, they look through what they've got and they decide to sell some things and they've got these old um, football programs and they gather them together into a lot and they sell them for £50 on eBay. Then a week later, they notice that the person who's selling them, or, or who bought them off of the, that person, is selling them again. And they have a look, and there's one of theirs there, and it turns out to be a really rare one, which is worth thousands. And they let it go for just 50 quid. That's the sort of thing that does happen to some people. Um, another thing is um, someone who's really into uh, cycling, and they may be really excited to discover that the Tour de France is coming to the UK, and it's going right past their front door. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen the Tour de France, but there's a huge amount of build-up to it, but when it actually arrives, the peloton isn't very long, and it goes by in seconds. So just imagine this person, they're so excited, they're watching the build-up, and they go, I just go and make a quick cup of tea. And by the time they get back, the peloton's gone by, and they've missed it, and they'll never have that opportunity to see the Tour de France from their window again. And of course, there's many other areas where this sort of thing might happen. And whenever it does, the person is really gutted. They feel upset. And they just can't believe that they have missed out, that they're being so silly. And at other times, um, it takes a little while for it to sink in. They don't realize that they've missed out on something until a little bit of time passes. This idea of missing out on a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity really can be applied to the uh, city of Jerusalem and the nation of Israel on this day that we've been reading about. The day that Jesus rode into Jerusalem as a king. What we now know as Palm Sunday was a very, very important day. It was a day that a lot of scripture had been building up to. It had been predicted in the prophets. It was a day that the nation of Israel were waiting for and they were looking forward to it and they were longing for it. But when it arrived, they completely missed it. They missed their opportunity, which resulted in terrible consequences. It was also a bit of a surprise for Jesus' followers and his disciples. They had these ideas of what Jesus was going to do. Their expectation was that Jesus was going to set up some sort of a kingdom and that they would be involved in the leadership of it. If you just read the Gospels, if you read Matthew, Mark and Luke in particular, we see that the disciples are arguing about who's the greatest. They're sort of trying to work out who's going to be the number two in Christ's kingdom. They really expected Jesus to set up some sort of political kingdom when he went into Jerusalem. They were expecting him to lead an uprising and kick the Romans out. So they had the wrong end of the stick. The only person who knew exactly what was going on was, of course, our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. And here in Luke's Gospel, this is very clear. If you look back at what's just happened before this, we see that Jesus has been uh, telling the parable of the ten minus. And that's a bit like the parable of the uh, talents that we see in Matthew's Gospel, but there's a few differences. And in this one, we see that at the beginning, there's a king who's going off to another place, or a, a leader is going to be off to another place to be made a king and then come back. And while he's away, the people send a message saying, we do not want this man to be king. And then the king returns, he rewards those servants who have been faithful with things, and those people who did not want him to be king were in a lot of trouble. And then Jesus marches into Jerusalem. So you can clearly see the link that's going on between the, the uh, two of them. So with this parable ringing in the disciples' ears, Jesus is on the march to the city. And as we look at this passage, we see that there's quite a few things coming together, quite a few important things. And the first one is, of course, the fulfillment of prophecy. And the prophecy that's probably the one that's most clearly being fulfilled is found in Zechariah 9, verse 9, which reads... 
Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So there's a command there to rejoice. The city's been told to give thanks because the king is coming and he will be riding on the colt, the foal of a donkey. We also see in Zechariah 14 that the Messiah would appear on the Mount of Olives and we see that this is set on the Mount of Olives. Israel has been waiting for their Messiah for centuries and the way that Jesus enters the city shines a spotlight on who he really is. Anyone who knew the scriptures would understand what was going on and see in Jesus' actions things that have been predicted hundreds of years beforehand. But as we shall see, the problem is, the people who had this knowledge didn't believe that Jesus was the one that God had set. The second thing that we see the Lord doing is he's forcing the hands of the religious leaders so that um, they move onto God's timetable. The religious leaders, they wanted to arrest Jesus, they wanted to silence him, but they wanted to do it quietly, and they knew that the worst time to arrest him was when Jerusalem was filled with pilgrims from all over the place. Many of them would have been Jesus' followers, and they knew that they were really running the risk of a riot if they arrested Jesus when Jerusalem was filled with pilgrims. But... Jesus, he rides in victorious. He rides in as a king. And after Jesus has ridden in as a king, his enemies have got to do something. The third thing, the thing that we see happening is the response of the religious leaders in Jerusalem. And by, in a sense, they're representing the nation. How do they respond to Jesus? They have here an opportunity of achieving peace with God. But, as we'll see they don't uh, carry through on it. And fourthly, as we look at all these things that are happening, we see that everything is under Jesus' control. Some people think that Jesus made a mistake and ended up on the cross. But if you read the Gospels, you see quite clearly, he knew exactly what had to be done, he knew exactly what was going to happen, and he knew when it was going to happen as well. So we see that Jesus is in control of every situation. And we see this at the start of our passage as he sends some disciples ahead of him to pick up a coat, the foal of a donkey. And he knows exactly what is needed. He knows exactly where it is. And he knows that he needed a coat that no one had ever ridden. The fact that this um, donkey had never been ridden before is a sign that it's um, a pure donkey. It's linked to purity. Jesus enters Jerusalem riding on a colt of a donkey that had never been ridden before. It was unused. It was pure. By the end of the week, he's in a tomb that had also been unused. A tomb that was pure, that no one else had ever been laid into. So we see that there's... Um, a purity, a standard of holiness, as it were, that is linked to what Jesus is doing. So Jesus is in control. He tells his disciples where to go, and he tells them what to say. And that's quite important, because an, a coat of a donkey, it's like, um, in modern terms, if someone had just had a new car delivered outside their house. It's just parked there outside. It's never been driven before. And some strangers come along and go to take it. What would you say in that situation? <laughs> I think you'd try to stop them, wouldn't you? Which is exactly what happens here. But Jesus has given his disciples the words that are needed so that the cult will be released to them. Now, the scholars debate about how this happened and what's going on here. And some people think that uh, this cult actually belonged to some followers of Jesus. Jesus had his disciples, then he had a larger group of followers. And when we look at John's Gospel, we see that Jesus had been in Jerusalem before. Um, so it could be that uh, these were followers of Christ, and as soon as they said, the Lord needs it, that's it, it would have been released straight away. But then again, it could have been something else that was going on. But what's important is the right sort of transportation is put in place. A saddle is fashioned out of clothing, and Jesus' and his, uh, Jesus his disciples and followers now give him the red carpet treatment. And you can just imagine the scene, can't you? Jesus is there, he's got his disciples. 
He's got his followers. And they're going up to Jerusalem on pilgrimage. They would have been with other Jews from Galilee. There would have been a huge crowd of people going in. And of course, because of most of Jesus' ministry has been in Galilee, it means that the people around know who he is. And they've seen what he has done. So it's no surprise that these people just burst into thanksgiving because they, they know what he's done. Now, they may have had a mixed understanding of who he was. Some of them would have thought he's a prophet. Some people were saying, we've got to make him king. Other people may have been saying, he's definitely the Messiah. And of course, they were right. He was the Messiah. But he was not the sort of Messiah that they were expecting. They were expecting a Messiah to kick the Romans out of the land, to give them independence and freedom once again to worship God. But instead, that's not what Jesus has come to do. Jesus has come to do something far more important. Jesus has come to deal with the problem of sin, which alienates us from God. He's come to die on that cross so that we could have peace with God, peace between God and man. However, despite this misunderstanding of what the people were expecting, it's important and right for Jesus to receive the royal welcome into Jerusalem that he deserves. And for this moment, Jesus is surrounded by his loyal disciples, his followers, the people who have witnessed the things he's done. They have seen the blind receive their sight. They have seen the lame walk. They have seen the deaf hear. They have seen the leper cleansed. And they have even seen the dead raised. They've also heard all of his teaching and know that he speaks with an authority which is different to what their own Pharisees and scribes and rabbis had. So with all this going through their minds and as they approach the city on pilgrimage, it's right that the words of Psalm 118 bubble up and they burst out. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And this outburst of praise is exactly how people should respond to what Jesus has done, to what God's wonderful grace has worked in their lives. Just like these enthusiastic followers of Christ, we should regularly thank God for what he has done. We should count our blessings and thank the Lord for his kindness. As a church, we long for a time, don't we, when we can take our masks off and we can sing God's praise once again. And we've got a lot to thank the Lord for, for carrying us through this dreadful period. Right now, we've got to wait. But when we're at home in a we can uh, praise the Lord. We can put on a worship CD or listen to something on YouTube or stream something and give thanks to the Lord. And this really does help us, especially in times when we might be feeling a bit low ourselves. Spend some time singing the Lord's praises and just going over the ways that the Lord has provided for us really does help. Going back uh, to this entrance into Jerusalem, for Peter and the other disciples, this must have been what they were waiting for, this large public display of support. As they marched towards the city, surrounded by these people, they must have been over the moon. Their master was getting the red carpet treatment that he deserved. All of their dreams seemed to be coming true. They were getting noticed that the people were following Jesus. And if they followed Jesus, then everything would be different. But it was not to be. Because alongside this praise, we also have the negative response. Some of the Pharisees were also coming in with the pilgrims into the city from Galilee. And they tried to put a stop to what was happening. Now these are the men who knew the scriptures. And they knew, they could see that Jesus was fulfilling prophecy. But they did not believe that he was the Messiah. And they were filled with fear. Under Roman rule, they knew that if they put a foot wrong, they could bring disaster down upon the nation. The Romans had a real track red record of brutally putting down any insurrection. And as Jesus had not been recognized by the leaders as the Messiah, what the Pharisees are doing are trying to keep the status quo. They're trying to make sure that Jesus isn't noticed by these people who could be so brutal. So they asked Jesus to put a stop to it, to get the disciples and his followers into some kind of order. But remember, Jesus knows who he is, and he knows exactly what is going to happen. 
The people are responding in the right way. In fact, this is such a long anticipated moment. This moment when the Son of God rides into Jerusalem, when the King meets his people, it's essential that the people praise. And he tells these Pharisees that if the people do not rejoice, then the inanimate mute creation, the stones would cry out glory as the one through whom this world was made approaches the city of his people. And this response, saying that the stones will sing out his praise, may contain more than meets the eye because it's an allusion to a passage in Habakkuk 2 verse 11. And in Habakkuk, Habakkuk 2 verse 11 we read, The stones of the wall will cry out and the beams of the woodwork will echo it. Something about creation saying something. Now in that passage, what is the prophet declaring? It's not praise of God. The stones are declaring judgment. Judgment on the Chaldeans, upon that great nation of Babylon, which took Judah into exile centuries before. And as Jesus alludes to that passage, which the Pharisees would have recognised, there's, as it were, a warning to them, isn't there? It's a subtle rebuke to them. Because, you know, if they are rejecting Jesus, then there is going to be judgment. What happened to the Babylonians who went far too far in what God had authorised them to do and had brought judgment on them? There's a warning that what happened to them will happen to you as well. If the people did not praise, then the creation would, and its voice would declare judgment on these people. These people who were made in the image of God, they're members of God's covenantal people, and yet they've turned their back on what God is doing. They're not recognising that God is there, bringing the prophecies to fulfilment. These people are missing the most important of opportunities. So Jesus is riding into Jerusalem as the Prince of Peace. He is not going to lead a military campaign, but rather he's going to lay down his life so that people can have peace with God. And it's ironic, isn't it, that this road to the cross, which Jesus always knew he was going to have to walk, relies upon the religious leaders rejecting him as Messiah. But it just shows you that God knows the future and he knows what's going to happen. And God knew that these people would miss their opportunity to recognise Jesus as the one they were waiting for, as the Messiah. And at this critical moment, we gain an insight into the heart of our Lord. You can just imagine him reaching a place on this road where he can see the city in front of him. And all around him, his supporters are praising God. They are thanking the Lord and there's the Pharisees there whispering and muttering and trying to get them to be silent. And yet, what does Jesus do? The king on the donkey, he looks at the city and he weeps. He knows that the people of the city would miss this opportunity. So he is filled with sadness. And his sadness is not about what will happen to him. He always knows that he's going to go to the cross. His sadness is about what is going to happen to these people because they are rejecting him. You see, when God offers you peace and you reject it, there is only one thing left. And that thing that's left is judgment. And that it always brings sadness. Because the more you love someone, the more you grieve. And here we see Jesus grieving over Jerusalem. And we know that God loves his people. So this grief that Jesus is showing is a sign of the love of God for his people. Jesus knows that from that point in about 35 years' time, give or take a bit, the Roman legions would destroy Jerusalem. The city would undergo an absolutely horrific siege. It would be captured and completely destroyed. The Jewish historian Josephus, who witnessed that siege, he'd uh, defected to the Romans. He estimated that 1.1 million people died in that siege. And 100,000 people were captured and taken into slavery. And most of those slaves ended up um, as gladiators. They ended up in the arena facing the lions and things like that. A terrible way to end their lives. This is what happened to Jerusalem. 
And as we look at this, as we look at the end of verse 44, Jesus says, they will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God coming to you. That destruction is attributed to them not recognizing the Messiah, to this missed opportunity when Jesus came into the city. And for Jesus, this must have been heartbreaking. So like several of the prophets before him, he laments and mourns over what will happen to these people because they do not recognize what God is doing and they do not recognize God's voice and they reject God's commands to turn to him. And for us today, there's an important lesson here, um, especially when we apply this principle to the gospel message. As Christians, we're told to go out there and share the gospel with the people of this world. And one aspect of the gospel message that we often overlook is that it does contain a command to repent. It's not a request, it's a command. We see this um, particularly when Paul is preaching in Athens in Acts 17, verses 30 to 31. And he says to the people there, these scholars in Athens, these real clever clogs, he says, in the past... God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. And he has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. So we've got a link there to the importance of the resurrection, which we'll be looking at next week. Through the gospel, God is providing a way for him to have peace with people to have peace with God, and that includes that forgiveness of sins, adoption into his family, and the wonderful gift of eternal life. And people are commanded to respond to the gospel and enjoy peace with God. And all those that do will be accepted and will become followers of the Lord. But all those who reject the gospel are making a terrible mistake and missing a golden opportunity. As the theologian George Smeaton puts it, The rejection of Christ's atonement is a new transgression, the enormity of which far outweighs all other sins, whether we think of the greatness of his person or the fact that it is a sin against the remedy. It shuts the door of mercy. And that's what's happening when people reject the gospel message. Rejecting Christ is the sin of sins. Jerusalem was guilty of it nearly 2,000 years ago, Today, every time someone ignores the gospel, then they are also missing, themsel- missing out and putting themselves into the place of danger. So this morning, as we think about this, as you listen maybe online, where do you stand? Would you be someone who knows Jesus, who rejoices in what he has done and desires to sing his praise? Would you be part of that group of people coming down into Jerusalem, worshipping the Lord, and recognizing him as the Messiah? Are you someone who is willing to live your life for him, using your skills and abilities in his service? This is just one of the ways that we can show, that we can respond to the wonderful love that he has shown us. We think back, don't we, to how this week finished all those years ago, with Christ's terrible death on the cross where he paid the price for our sins, for our wrongdoing. But then we also know that on the first day of the week, that first Resurrection Sunday, Christ rose again, he defeated death, he completed the great work of salvation and made it possible for us to be redeemed from our sin. If that is you, then you know what to do. We praise him and we live our lives for him. However, there's that other group of people on the road, the Pharisees, who sought to silence Christ and the many people in Jerusalem who just ignored him. For them, they missed out on their Messiah. They missed out on the peace that only he could bring. And then as a consequence of this rejection, they ended up facing judgment. Today, don't make the same mistake that they made. While we wait for Christ's return, the door is still open. There is still time for people to repent, to turn away from your old way of living and to put your trust in Jesus. And if you do that, you experience forgiveness and you can find peace with God. And if that's something you need to find out more about, uh, then please do get in touch with us here at Great Harbor Christian Fellowship. 
Don't fall into the trap that most people in this world fall into. The biggest problem that people have on spiritual matters is they think that they are okay. We always measure ourselves by our own standards, and according to our own standards, we're pretty good. We know people that are better than us, but we know a lot of people who we think are worse than us. But that is not the way. What we have to do is to measure ourselves by God's standards. It's a bit like when someone is sitting in an exam, and they sit down and there's an exam paper given to them, and that's been set by the teachers or an examining board and they fill it in, and then it's taken away, and it's marked. And it's the person who's marked it. They're the ones who say whether you're passed or failed. You don't write the test yourself and mark it yourself, do you? Because if you did that, you're guaranteed to pass. Instead, you've got to meet the standard that someone has set. And it's the same with salvation. We have to meet God's standards. And according to God, no one meets that standard. Romans 3, verse 23. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Each and every one of us has failed. And if we think we've passed, we're just kidding ourselves. But there is hope. There is hope because Jesus went to the cross on that first ever Good Friday. He went and he paid the price for our wrongdoing, so it's possible for us to be forgiven. It's like Jesus has taken that exam paper off us, he's filled in all the correct answers, and then he's written our name at the top so that we get a benefit from his knowledge. Scripture says that we're clothed in his righteousness. His righteousness is given to us so that God sees that we are right, that we are righteous in his sight, and therefore we meet his standards. And that means that we can be forgiven and enjoy peace with God. Right now, the opportunity to respond to this incredible love is there. But don't miss it. Don't miss this wonderful opportunity. Turn to him today. Amen. Let's pray together. Father God, we do just thank you that in your grace and mercy, you sent the Lord Jesus Christ to uh, be our saviour all those years ago. We thank you that he knew exactly what needed to be done. He was in control of every situation, every circumstance. We thank you that he fulfilled all of those prophecies which prove beyond the shadow of a doubt that he is the one that you were going to send. And we do just thank you, Lord Jesus, that you went to the cross for us. We thank you that you were willing to bear the burden of our wrongdoing so that we could be forgiven. And we do just pray that you help us to value this peace that we enjoy with God more and more with each passing day. Help us to worship you, help us to praise you more and to live our lives for you. And give us great courage and confidence in sharing the gospel. Your word is the only way that people can get right with God, so we do just ask that you help us this day. And Lord, for any who hear this message who have not responded yet, we do just want to pray that they will hear that command and they would turn to you. We ask that you would soften their hearts and give them the faith that they need to trust in you completely. Father God, we do just pray that you would have mercy upon them in the same way that you had mercy upon us. And we do just pray that you would build your kingdom as you bring more and more people to save in faith in you. Amen.